<laughs> so, we'll start off with sort of the, uh, the initial um, slide of kind of why we're doing this. And so this is a picture of the Marlboro Man, sort of the quintessential American cowboy. And of course, he smokes a cigarette. And as we all know, smoking isn't great for you and can have some pretty severe consequences. And so, if you smoke enough, you know, at some point you might start coughing a lot. And when you cough, then blood comes out. And this is sort of where the medical field starts to get more interested in what's going on with you. And if you had been born in, you know, 1870, this might have been the procedure that would have been the next step after coughing blood. But luckily, most of you were not alive around then, and so we have much better tools that are available to us today that allow us to sort of image what's going on and try to figure out what's happening inside of your lungs during this breakdown. And so this is an example of sort of a CT scan, and here you're able to go through the entire body and look at all the different anatomical structures, and you can see lungs and muscles and heart, and hopefully tumors as well. This is something called PET-CT, and so this is where you take a CT scan and you use even more um, information or get even more information out of it by adding a contrast agent that lights up where sugar is being used. And so this can give you a much better idea of not only what's going on at sort of the physical structural level, but at the biological and chemical level. And so these scans are for us, pretty difficult to understand, but for kind of a radiologist, you can imagine this is sort of like, where's Waldo? And so you have a game where, well, where's Walter for the Germans? If you're looking at this picture, you're trying to find a man sort of wearing a striped shirt. And, you know, lots of stripes appear on this page. It's a very kind of difficult challenge. But radiology is not even that simple. And so it's not for one image, it's not four images. It's something more like this. And Waldo could be hiding on any one of these slides. And Waldo doesn't even need to be that big. And of course, it's here not a game. It's here about actually diagnosing a patient and make sure that they get the right treatment. And so in case you thought this, exagger this example was a bit exaggerated, it's actually not. On the left, we have an example of a CT scan. And we show you here what Waldo really looks like. And so it's this tiny little grayish spot that doesn't look that much different than anything else that's around it. And this could be the difference between you living another 30 years and you dying in a few months. And so this is a pretty intense responsibility to have and a very difficult sort of problem to solve because I think anyone would admit you could easily sort of go through an image and miss something like that. And so what radiologists do is they sort of go through the images, kind of slice by slice, looking at all of it, trying to figure out, are there any Waldos, or are there any signs of tumor inside of this patient? And so this involves today, sort of looking at all the images and writing a very detailed report where they talk about exactly what's inside this image and what things might be relevant for the diagnosis. And so what we're going to focus on specifically is really the first step of this diagnosis, and this is called staging. And so when you get diagnosed with lung cancer, they don't just say you have lung cancer, we should do something about it, but they come up with a very specific assessment of how far your lung cancer has progressed. And so this is sort of for the data science people, a classification you know, you have five different levels for what the tumor can be, four levels for what sort of the lymph node involvement could be, two levels for metastases, eight different stages for treatment planning, and you kind of have this detailed table to go through where you decide everything that's important for the patient. And kind of the underlying question is why is it even interesting to try to automate this? I mean, doctors do this every day. Why would you try to build software that can do this automatically? Or why is this even relevant for sort of a data science conference? And so one of the things that's really critical is that misstagings happen a lot and have very serious consequences for the patient. So if you get understaged, they might not treat the cancer as harshly as they should. 
And that means after going through surgery and all of this, you will still have tumor left over that can come back um, much stronger than the initial tumor was. And of course, if you over-treat, you might end up with someone who can't breathe or do sports anymore well, where you actually didn't need to take that harsh of a treatment. You could have done something much simpler. And so because overstaging and understaging is such a problem, currently two physicians take over an hour each to perform this initial assessment. And even with this going on, there is a sort of unconscionable amount of errors and mistakes and misstaging that happen due to all sorts of different reasons. And often, even after they've looked at all this, there's information that's very important that's sort of left out. And so when you're trying to figure out what sort of the next steps of treatment are, or which you know, drugs you could use on them, there are important things that aren't present which make it difficult to do this. And so, you know, as this is a data science uh, conference, you know, the answer to kind of everyone's problems today seems to be to use deep learning, certainly in the image analysis field. And sort of Google, Facebook, Apple, Baidu, Watson, Stanford, University of Washington, all have come up with these very, very complicated algorithms, which are able to solve problems that we haven't been able to solve before. And so this seems like intuitively the right approach to take. You know, you have really cool algorithms that can do all kinds of things a human can do. Why not try this in medicine? And so, you know, is deep learning really our saving grace? And there are some pretty big issues with it. And so um, for all of you who sort of explored online, this is something called the TensorFlow Playground from Google. And here, you know, you can put in a spiral pattern and have it use a neural network to try to learn that. And you see that it takes kind of six layers, over 30 neurons, 3,000 epics of training in a noise-free data setting to learn how to produce a spiral. And, you know, any of you who can use Python or R or C could write a feature that found a spiral in about one line of code. And so using deep learning to figure out what a spiral is, is huge, makes the problem substantially more complicated than it needs to be. And if you think this is how much it takes to figure out what a spiral is, you can only imagine how much it is to figure out how something like cancer looks, or how to differentiate between two very similar patients, because this is just two variables on a fairly simple plane. With medical images, you have thousands of variables that you're trying to account for. Um, for all of those or all of you who've used TensorFlow, you kind of see these other problems that you run into, and you know this resource exhausted error is something that I guess most of you have probably run into before, because when you're trying to do images, you're very limited by resources. And so if you're particularly doing deep learning, you know you do everything on the GPU because it's so fast and so quick, but you make a lot of trade-offs for doing that. And so you know, you have very limited memory, you know, 16 to 24 gigabytes in sort of the most extreme cases. You can't really do branching or a lot of the standard operations you do. And with a CPU, you can have machines that have sort of terabytes of memory. You can do memory mapping very easily. You have few cores, but you have a lot of flexibility on what each one of these is doing. And so you have a whole lot more options in terms of how you can solve problems. And if we take sort of a very simple example from Google, their inception network that they use for classifying images into different categories, if you were to sort of directly transfer that onto the medical imaging problems that we're looking at, it would take 338 gigabytes for a batch size of one, which is already an incredibly small batch. So you trying to actually train and solve a problem with something like this would be extraordinarily difficult. The other problem is sort of training data. And so when you look at major competitions like ImageNet, you have sort of 59,000 pixels per image, 1.2 million images, which in sort of a very rough, not information theory approved description is kind of 0.04 variables or pixels per category, per example. And then you have sort of 1,200 examples per category, which isn't great, but it's, you know, enough that it seems reasonable that you could start to get a solution out of this problem. 
When we look at lung cancer in the images that we have, we have 157 million pixels per patient and 2,000 patients, which is already the largest study of its kind. And so this means that you have 78,000 variables per example. So it's 3.9 million times worse from sort of an information ratio than ImageNet is. And so to think ImageNet gets great answers, we should be able to get great answers. It's very naive in this field. And then also kind of 50 examples per category. And so there it's only 24 times worse, but it's still significantly enough worse that it's a very challenging problem to try and solve. And so here is kind of this uh, comic that we really like for deep learning where you sort of show, you know, this is your machine learning system. You pour data in this big pile of linear algebra and then collect answers at the other side. And, you know, if the answers aren't right, you then slowly stir the pile until they start looking right. And I think this is a quite accurate description of what's being done, maybe a little bit oversimplified. But basically, we've gotten really far in the machine learning world by learning how to stir big piles. And so this sort of refers to stochastic gradient descent on deep neural networks. That's that linear algebra, and that's how you stir. You can do it really quickly, because GPUs allow you to do a lot of these operations sort of in parallel across thousands of cores. And we've had a lot of data available, which has led us sort of to pour on lots and lots of things so that eventually you get answers that start looking right. And so to kind of start off with deep learning in medicine, you know, there are models, there are groups that have tried this before. We don't think we're the first ones to try to bring deep learning to medicine. And so here are kind of some of the common things that have already been done with things like UNet, 3DNet, Pyramid, LSTM. And, you know, they kind of take a fairly simple problem like segmentation and try to solve that. So here we see an example of sort of what a UNet architecture looks like and how you can go from an image to a result, and the result seems fairly reasonable. But it's not quite that simple. And so if you use UNet to segment something like bone, which is the easiest thing, or one of the easiest things in the bodies to segment, you have 7 million parameters that you need to fit in order to get a reasonable result. Over 2,000 manually labeled test images to actually sort of train your algorithm hours of training, and then when you actually build this fantastic algorithm and you want to run it on a computer without a GPU, which in a hospital is the reality, you can have hours for one execution on one patient. And so, you know, when you look at this is how you segmented bone before, this has around 15 parameters, all of which have some sort of anatomical or physiological significance. It takes 1% of the computation time, and as 2% higher accuracy, it seems like deep learning is potentially very, very inefficient at solving this kind of problem, particularly using something like UNEP to do this. Another thing that you have is that, you know, if you train it to segment lungs, you can get really, really high performance. And so here we have an example where it's sort of over 99% accuracy at segmenting this, but if you rotate the image 90 degrees, as you see here, it has absolutely no idea what a lung looks like. So, what does the image show? What's, what did you segment? Uh, here you see Kidneys? lungs. Oh. So, this is the CT image. Lungs are sort of the air inside of your body. Here you see the lung sort of in one slice segmented. Here you have the image rotated by 90 degrees. And here you have what the algorithm segmented. And so obviously, any rational person would have expected the result to be just a 90 degree rotated image. But the algorithm has absolutely no idea what a lung is. It's just learned to memorize lots of different fancy patterns. And that's what it decided to spit out. And so with this, it can be very, very difficult. We actually have a nice example online. If you want to look at it yourself on Kaggle, where we show this happening in medical images, where you end up with data sets or train, you train models where it doesn't understand what you're trying to do at all. It just kind of learns to spit out the results that you like. And so, you know, the next step of this is, of course, well, obviously you could train it on images that are rotated 90 degrees. And you do that, and then it forgets how to segment the original images. 
And then you have to sort of enhance your training so that it tries training lungs at every possible different rotation because it has no idea what a lung is. And so these are the kinds of things where deep learning at the moment is just very far away from understanding these kind of broader scale topics that are important for solving difficult problems. The other thing is that kind of every patient is slightly different. And so here you kind of have an example that you know they're slightly different position on the scanner. Every scanner has slightly different artifacts that they're bringing into the data. And each patient has at least a few hundred, and depending on who you ask, a few thousand completely benign abnormalities inside their body. And so if you try to account for all of this in an algorithm, it's going to be very, very difficult. This problem isn't simple. It's not about looking for cats. It's about trying to find cats in fields of lions. And so it's a very tricky problem to try to solve. And so our sort of experience with this is, I guess, very related to this other XKCD comment, where you kind of think we're very good at data analytics. Medicine is just one more field, and doctors have no idea how computers work, so we'll be able to solve their problems immediately. And that's obviously not the case. And so one of the things that's been very important for us and sort of the learnings is that we need to learn smarter. And so we need to kind of incorporate the things that we already know. So we know things like lung tumors don't show up in the brain. It's kind of called context. We know that lungs are supposed to be full of air. It's kind of normality. You know, if it's not full of air, there's something wrong with your lung. It's at least worth noting, if not the most important thing for the diagnosis. And the next things are kind of how do you train these networks more efficiently? And so how, you know, standard loss functions where you're looking at things like mean squared air or mean absolute air or dice or intersection over union or accuracy and cross entropy work very well for kind of simple contest-like problems, but don't really apply that well to real medical situations. And so, you know, if you look at one of the patients, one metastasis can completely change treatment planning and outcome likelihoods. And this is sort of a minor, minor fraction of the image, but this one pixel or this one or two pixels can make all of the difference in the world for what your result spits out. And so if you're using a score, like how accuracy did you classify, how accurately did you classify each pixel? You classified all the pixels but one accurately, but you got completely the wrong diagnosis. And so how can you sort of take into account these kind of factors, which are very difficult with standard approaches? So one of the things that's important is kind of how do you incorporate what you already know? And so the body and anatomy are fairly well understood. I mean, you know what a person looks like. Every person has a head. Most people have two arms, two legs, two lungs, two kidneys. And so you can bring a lot of this sort of prior information in and incorporate them in your models to try to make them more aware of kind of what's going on and less likely to focus on things that are completely irrelevant or just sort of noise signals. We can then also try to define better what's normal. And one of the sort of more interesting ways to do this is where you think about what a doctor actually does. And so when a physician sees a patient, they sort of imagine what a normal person looks like. They know this in their head because they've seen lots and lots of normal people. And then they compare what they see in the patient and what they know in their mind is normal. And this gives them a very good starting point for trying to figure out what could be suspicious. So that rather than trying to find a disease in sort of a sea of voxels, you're now trying to find differences with what you would have expected. The next thing is kind of training more efficiently. And so, you know, neural networks that won ImageNet in these kind of contests you know, use things like convolutional neural networks and fully connected layers. And I won't really get into them, but they're fully positionally independent. And so that means if you have a cat in the upper left-hand corner, you treat it the same way as a cat in the bottom right. And for medicine, that's clearly not the case. A cat, you know, a tumor in your lung is very different. You know, a piece of muscle inside of your lung is probably a very bad sign. A piece of muscle in your leg is a very good sign. And so having something that just looks for that probably isn't going to be very useful for what you're trying to do. You then have sort of the fully connected layers, which give you the ability to kind of be position dependent. But these are then incredibly sensitive for very small changes, because you're now linking every single pixel in your image 
and not looking at sort of what's going on at a larger scale and very, you know, if the patient moves up two millimeters, you could get a completely different result even though this isn't relevant. And so, yeah, medicine is different and a lot of these ideas that apply well to standard problems don't apply as well to medical images. You know, one of the other things is these kind of these decision boundaries are very often not linear. You know, you can have lots and lots of tumor and if you don't count all of it, it's not a problem. You know, once you have some tumor, you're already in the cancer stage, having lots may not always be a bad thing or may not always be worse, but a tiny bit of metastases is always a problem. Um, cancer distributions are very skewed, and so, you know, a lot of cancer takes up less than 1% of the image. You know, you can make something that accurately classifies cancer, even in very cancerous patients, that has an accuracy of 99% that just says no. But this isn't a very useful device. This hasn't learned anything or extracted anything valuable. This just simply spits no out. And so one of the things that we found very important to do in this area is to kind of use adversarial techniques so that rather than having a simple metric that says if your classifier worked correctly or your segmentation worked correctly, so these standard loss scores, that you sort of have techniques that are constantly evolving what this loss score could be and constantly improving your network based on it. So you don't give it a fixed criteria because as soon as you give it a fixed criteria, your network will kind of learn how to cheat and just spit out that number correctly rather than actually going through the process and accounting for all the different things that can happen. The last thing, which has kind of been one of the most important, is this idea of kind of high quality targeted annotations. And so, you know, if you can focus the algorithms on the right parts of the image, you can get a much better accuracy. And so most of the pixels in the images aren't relevant at all. And so if we can help guide the models that we use through things like attention, we can have it focus on the small amount of data that is actually relevant for what we're looking at. And so here you see kind of the 40 different categories that we've come up with for sort of identifying different types of lesions that you might find. And so we're not only including what the lesion or where the lesion is, but what it is. And so you give a much more granular or fine granular data set to an algorithm to learn from, which makes it much easier for it to kind of understand the important things for diseases. This is then sort of an example of kind of how these tools that we've built look like, because you know a lot of this stuff doesn't exist, particularly when you have 40 different categories you want to account for. And that you know these are the kind of results that you're marking, that you now have a lot of different types of things that you're labeling inside of images, and that you need to be able to look at them easily. And annotations aren't easy. And so here's sort of an example from a number of different physicians and different algorithms trying to annotate the same lesion. And you get a huge variety of different results, depending on you know, if the physician was paying attention, if they were distracted, if the um, image was particularly noisy, or they were using tools like sort of active contours or snakes, which helped them segment the image quicker that you start to get very different results. And so trying to assess how you make sure this data has a really high quality is very important. And so that was another thing we really had to go into was building quality control and audit tools so that we could examine all of these images very closely. And then finally, kind of incorporating other information. And so one of the things that has been the most useful for us are these techniques like synthetic gradients which allow you to take a lot of these complicated models apart into little pieces without having them completely connected together, which means you can start focusing on sort of different tasks and incorporate different types of information inside. And so this is just a brief example of what that is. And so sort of when we've done all of this, we've substantially reduced sort of the challenge of the problem, or at least the underfitting of the data that we have. And sort of the current status is that we've now gone through 300 patients and we sort of have the detailed markings of all of these patients with over 2,000 different lesions. And as you see, there's a huge variety in the kind of lesions that we've collected and found. And, you know, even once you've applied all these approaches, no one really knows which models will work best. And so one of the things that we spent quite a bit of time doing is coming up with good ways of knowing a model has worked well and testing and comparing lots of different models against each other. You know, how much 
does each extra parameter or each extra layer or each extra operation cost so that you can compare, you know, 20 different neural networks that are trying to solve the same problem. Each one of these things can take days to train, and so of course computationally this is a very large scale task. There's well over 10,000 different types of architectures which can work really well, and so finding the best will sort of take time, but we think we're on a good path to get there, and we have everything set up to make this process as automated and quick as possible. So kind of the, the last thing is once you've kind of built these tools and come up with all these results, how do you communicate this effectively to the physicians that you're dealing with? And so one of the common criticisms about neural networks is that they're black boxes. But for a medical physician, a uh, support vector machine is also a black box. Anything sort of more complicated than a decision tree is already a black box. And so saying a neural net is more of a black box isn't particularly useful. The problem isn't that you can't trace every mathematical operation. The problem is it gives a result without giving any kind of justification. And so one of the things that we've tried to work with is how do you explain things in an efficient manner that a radiologist can understand well. And so how do you present uncertainty? How do you sort of show the kind of quantitative analysis that they're used to? And the things that they're usually discussing with their colleagues inside of this framework where you have incredibly complicated models calculating all of this. And so we just have a few examples from this where we sort of show how we label and identify sort of the things that were used to make the decisions about the patients. And then how we can kind of construct simple rules so that it's traceable how a specific decision was made. Because physicians are very used to dealing with these standard guidelines. And if you can make things that also apply these sort of standard guidelines or come up with new standards that are even better, this works very well at communicating what you've actually done. And so here's sort of a few examples of these kind of rules. And then making everything very interactive. And so here's just kind of a quick demo of what a tool that we have looks like where you're actually able to see sort of what was evaluated, what was found on the patient, what are the probabilities associated with all of the different features that were found, and how can you sort of selectively incorporate or exclude information from this result. So kind of the last challenge that we can get to is sort of how can you enroll this to text? Because right now radiologists deal with lots of text, and so if you have an algorithm that spits out a number, or a table or a chart, that's nice, but ultimately you want to be able to produce reports just like radiologists produce. And so taking a very complicated analysis and then finally unrolling it into a text report is a very exciting, challenging thing that we're working on. And that kind of our next steps are sort of trying to get other hospitals and healthcare systems involved because getting lots of data is sort of one of the critical bottlenecks, even with all of these techniques. Um, sort of uh, make radiology, use radiologist feedback to make the models better. And so right now a lot of the feedback we've been incorporating is coming from more of the uh, computer science or data science side, less from the radiology side. And so how can we incorporate their expert knowledge into that? And then sort of how can we build new approaches for this? And so this is kind of the pipeline that we've set up for establishing and dealing with more and more different types of diseases that we have to expand beyond the hospitals that we've partnered with already. This is the team. Obviously, this is a multifaceted effort involving a large number of different players from the medical, software, and sort of machine learning side. And we've established a number of partners sort of with existing medical companies that have an idea of what physicians want to use and how we can integrate this with the systems that they have. And so, thank you for your attention, and we are hiring. Are there any questions? <laughs>